tuned in to Teng Tools Muscle Garage, the home of New Zealand's toughest muscle cars, hot rods, and street machines. Proudly brought to you by Teng Tools, in association with Mouchoff, Maguire's, and Nidaka. Coming up, we hit the 12th annual Aroha Cruisin, and we shed raid the Everest Studebaker Museum. Not in Indiana, but right here on the Kapiti Coast. But first, think 64 Chevys are only destined for a life low and slow? Not if this guy has anything to do with it. Thanks to Nidakar, meet Steve Adams and his home-built Biscayne muscle car. I've always been a fan of cars from sort of day one. So the, the bug for cars has always been there. I've never had the opportunity to purchase an American car and have it sitting in the garage and all that money sitting in the garage. Most of the time, I'd spend the money on a car because I needed it for work. And then all of a sudden the opportunity arose and then from that day on, I don't ever want to not have uh, you know, old school American car. I'd drive American cars all day, every day. I'd rather not have a modern car to be totally honest with you. Steve got a budget together to purchase his first American car. And the top of his list, a road ready mid 60s Nova or Chevelle. Shapes he'd soon discover were out of his price range for a good one. So the net was cast wider and longer and far from finished. We all know about Impalas and that sort of thing, but the Biscayne was kind of a something you don't see. It was two-door post instead of pillarless, so it had all these little quirky things and I thought, yeah, okay, this could be quite different and I could make it something a bit different. So once I got through the initial shock of, uh, of Karen and uh, the wife going, oh my God, what have you done? We chucked it in the garage and then I just laid a plan. First thing was, let's get some wheels. Those 20-inch staggered fit Riddlers would set the stage for the car's black and charcoal theme, but that also signals Steve's intent to move away from the traditional treatment of a 64 Chev and into muscle car territory. I wanted it to be an angry car, and I wanted it to sound angry. It's sort of taken the 64 from that low rider scene and the cruising scene, and it's just shown people, I suppose, and myself, that there's no reason why you can't have a big old angry 64, you know, it doesn't have to be a cruiser. It's understated, but it's kind of aggressive and angry, slightly louder than a bit normal, you know. Um, and the fact that, it, yeah, you're changing gears and things like that, it just, that idea to me is, is cool in a car. Chev's bare bones base model, the Biscayne, would prove the ideal blank canvas for that treatment too. It leaves the factory devoid of much of the Impala's bright work to begin with, but like Steve, the previous owner's ethos was to push that look further still. A lot of the chrome had been taken off, all the side trim and stuff had been taken off, the holes had been filled up and then just prime it over. So the, the idea to put all the chrome back on was never ever really a plan. It was always going to have a touch of chrome, but just not too much. I didn't like the stuff down the sides and all around the back and the boot. I kind of looked at the Biscayne being the base model. The Impala is like the one that has all the chrome on it, and I kind of wanted to keep it like that too. So yeah, just keep it quite plain and, and straightforward. The 64's all business approach continues when you lift the hood. Steve lunched a couple of boxes behind the original 327, a weak link rectified with a Tremec TKO 600 five speed. But then that old slippery slope of needing a bit more power took hold. Unfortunately for Steve, his first purchase, a 500 horsepower 383 stroke out of the US, turned out to be more fraud than fast. So that sort of put me back a little bit, you know. I was, I, that 15 grand would have been a hell of a lot towards a real big kick-ass type of motor, which is what I was sort of hoping to get. But as it turned out, the motor that's currently in it at the moment was in Auckland and it was at STA Parts. They obviously bought it in, Edelbrock crate motor. And my mate said to me, he said, oh mate, what about this? You know, 500 horsepower, blown, rah, rah, rah. Well, as soon as I looked at it, I was like, yeah, 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 let's just get that. The fact that it was black was just even better, you know. The 350 cube small block Chev is force fed by an Edelbrock E4 supercharger, topped with dual 600 CFM carbs. That Tremec TKO 600 is on shifting duties, serving ponies to the Curry 9 inch diff, while Wilwood brakes were tasked with bringing the brutish Chev to a stop. The 64 makes for a very drivable package with plenty of power on tap when Steve's right foot gets heavy. 
but perhaps the most impressive component? The guy behind the wheel who's built his first American car in his home garage. A Chevrolet Biscayne built to drive. I understand people build show quality cars, but I always wanted to build a car because I love driving. And I feel that if you're going to spend time and effort putting a car together, then there's no point at just going to the odd show and, or in your garage and then popping out once or twice. And I think the whole culture in New Zealand is there's a lot of people that, okay, they can't have that type of car, but they appreciate what's gone into it. And they, they, get a, they get a thrill out of just seeing the cars on the road and that sort of thing. So that's half the reason as well why I just want it to be out there. I want people to be able to see it, people to be able to get an idea. And if they want to copy anything I've done or they get ideas from what I've done, then great, it, I feel like I've helped someone out, you know? Right, thanks to our mates at Mount Shop, we're shed raiding. And this week, it's the Everest Studebaker Museum. Yes, museum, hidden away on the Kapiti Coast. In 1953, I was a joint apprentice, and an architect came in with a 1953 champion. And I was absolutely wrapped in this car because being a joiner, you do things different. And, and the car was different. And uh, he said when he ever wanted to sell it, we could buy it off him, and which we did. And that started the thing of Studebaker. And that love of the quirky American underdog clearly hasn't waned since. Together with his son, Brent, John has been bolstering this collection since the mid 60s. The grand plan? Every model change represented right up until Studebaker's auto division shut up shop in 66. But there's a simpler way of putting it. Dad's toys. <laughs> Dad's toys. Um, it's just a, a hobby, really. I mean, we could have bought any sort of car, but I suppose what's the biggest thing is that we had the building. A large building with no windows. Perfect for a car collection. And other activities too, it would seem. A couple of years ago there, we, I was at the window and the, uh, a police car pulled up at the front gate had no hat on, so I thought it was a friendly visit. He knocked on the door and he said, uh, uh, do you mind if I have a look inside? And I said, yeah, certainly, but why? He said, I was told it was a pea house. But no, it's an automotive addiction that's housed between these walls. Originally a producer of wagons and carriages, Studebaker entered the automobile business in 1902, first with electric vehicles and in 1904 with a shift to gasoline power in partnership with Garford. Both World Wars would benefit Studebaker's stocks with huge quantities of vehicles, particularly trucks, ordered before returning to focus their unique design aesthetic to the post-war passenger car market. Studebaker's spiritual home, the South Bend, Indiana plant, would eventually cease production late in 1964, while the last Studebaker would roll off Canada's Ontario line in 66. For John and son Brent, the purpose of curating New Zealand's own Studebaker Museum was a simple one was to keep cars as they were built, restored, restored or, or built, and even as they were found in that condition. And just to so memorabilia for people to, that are older people can sort of see what, in many cases, they had in their day. A lot of the uh, early pre-war ones, especially the Studebaker straight eights, were, were gobbled up in stock cars. Younger people today want them hot rodded than that, and that's no problem. That's no problem at all, but these ones here are all original, yeah. And the automobile company that dared to be different sure produced some memorable shapes and styles in its time. Perhaps none wilder than the Avanti. A high-performance four-seater coupe powered by a 289 Hawk motor, Studebaker's Avanti had a production run of less than 6,000 cars between 62 and 63 and was offered with the option of a Paxton supercharger. The car went on to break no less than 29 records at Bonneville's Salt Flats. The Avanti name lived on after Studebaker's demise right up until 2006, running GM and Ford chassis and engines. For the slightly more conservative market, models such as the Champion, Commander and the Lark and Hawk series still maintained a unique presence on the road throughout their model changes. Yeah, their body shells are different but in, in thing, but the mechanical stuff is much the same, like their six cylinders after the, uh, after the war remain much the same with just slight increases in power, and the eights were the same. So today we have no problem getting mechanical parts, body parts a little harder. I found recently though, when you say they finished in 63, 64, a lot of people that are around now weren't even born then, and they don't know what a Studebaker is. 
We have got others, we've got pickup trucks and we've got a delivery van, but you can't get any more in here and we're not building another building. <laughs> In a hobby where every car has its own story, things are no different in this collection. Not all stories start out happy, with a number of cars purchased from deceased estates. The owner's final wish of their classic to spend its days here in good company. And now that this lifelong collection is in John's family, the hope is that it's not going anywhere. It goes from myself to my son to his son. And, and Brent's son is named Sean. It's his car. So it will be handed on down like that. The many cases that we've heard once the, uh, the father and, and the husband and wife move on, the, some of the families just want to cash everything up. There's no sign of that, no. It, it's, it's very, it's uh, welcoming. <laughs> results, even at full sight. You're back with Tang Tools Muscle Garage. Right, this week those nice folks from Maguire's put gas in the tank and pointed us towards the usually sleepy little Waikato town of Te Aroha. Not so much on this day though. Welcome to the Aroha Cruisin', an event designed just over a decade back to bring visitors to this historic spa town. 2019 showing can again be hailed as a roaring success in that effort, with over 750 cars, bikes and caravans staking their claim on the main street nestled at the foot of Mount Tiaroha. Any excuse to get the car out, park it up and meet other people and you know go and see another town and wander around and see other cars, what else? <laughs> why not, you know? I always love the show, I love being under the hills, I like the Coromandel, this whole area and it's just the perfect size. Just a friendly little show. I find some of the ones that are just in a football field just a bit impersonal, but these ones, these ones out here are fantastic. Now in its 12th year, the Araha Cruisin's appeal is in keeping things simple. Yes, it's a judge show with trophies handed out for categories including best classic, custom, hot rod, bike, engine bay, work in progress, the list goes on. But perhaps the Cruisin's real success is that its organisers have maintained a small show atmosphere, despite the numbers creeping up each and every outing. Making an early but not so high speed run across the Waikato was Julian Stone in what would later be judged the day's best car and caravan combo. What we've got behind us is a 1951 Ford F1 pickup. It's running a straight six flathead. Me and a mate Roger Murray, we pulled it apart over a number of weekends and uh, built it from the chassis up. So it looks old, it looks crusty, the patina is nearly original, but every nut and bolt and bearing and everything's been touched on that car. It's been right back to the rails. Uh, what we are towing is a very fine assemblage of timber. So I had a little bit of time free and um, so I decided to knock myself up a caravan. Well, I wanted to go to car shows that were further afield, stay the night, and um, I didn't want to have anything boring. So I wanted something that could be in a show that I could stay in. And being a little bit of a tech geek, I've added a few things in there. So we've got 240 volt and 12 volt and iPhone chargers and a hidden television and all sorts of things. Even got an outdoor shower. Look, you go nowhere in a hurry, 
I swear Americans must have been thinner back in the day from the effort it takes to drive these things. But I took it down to Taupo recently with a friend. There were three modern um, trucks broken down the side of the road on the way. That little thing got up to Taupo at about 5k an hour over the hills and um, got me back in one piece. There's nothing, nothing too much wrong with it. Making the trek down from Auckland was Justin Baldwin in one sharp looking second generation Camaro. Uh, it's a 1978 RS Camaro. It's got a 350 four speed manual in it. Just been a dream car and I was fortunate enough four years ago to be able to purchase one. Things fall in place as you get older. <laughs> Bit of a petrol head all my life. I got out of racing and wanted a muscle car. The Camaros have always appealed to me uh, since I was growing up. So I had, I, I had to buy one. I hunted around for a year, finally this one come up. Uh, the appealing part was manual. You know, there's plenty of autos out there. Uh, very hard to find a, a manual car. December last year, we rebuilt the 350 in it. Um, I took the cast iron heads off, put some alloy heads on, uh, full rebuilt. So it's actually just done its running Ks now. So it's good to go for a uh, oil change in that when I get home. So the young fella and, I'm, and I enjoy it. Uh, we've done a few around the traps. I uh, want to get to a lot more, obviously work stopped that, um, so now it's sort of time to get out there and enjoy the car with a fully real bit white engine in it now, you know. The cruising always attracts a strong club presence and taking up a fair chunk of the real estate this year was the custom van club Parlour Vans. We've got mates here today from as far away as Wangarei, uh, up north Auckland, Hamilton, Tauranga and uh, yeah the vans are having a comeback man, custom vans is where it's at. The original vanny thing was you'd go away, sleep in it for a weekend, that's still a thing. But you're not a hot rod, you're not a street machine or a muscle car, it's a bit of an individual thing. Used to be the like the CF Jumbo with a 350, murals, flares, fat feet. Sort of died off a bit through the 80s, end of the 80s, 90s. But at the moment, panel vans, big vans, yeah they're cool man, they're still, still out there doing it. We might be a small organisation, have fun doing what we do. And today, mad turnout for us, that's really cool. Pile of Van's big presence was rewarded with the trophy for best car club. And if a bit of van action's your thing, make sure you check out their own event, the 2019 Van Revival, set to take over Natea the Saturday following Christmas. Next door was another club convoy, this time with a few less porthole windows and murals. We've got a group called the BOP Cruisers, normally do a cruise once a month. It's good to be active and cruising in a, in a line of valiance. There's not many of them around these days, um, but yeah, they, they still have a point of difference. They've got the Mopar heritage from the States. Most of these cars here were probably built in New Zealand at Todd Motors and down in um, Wellington. And Brendan's own VJ Hardtop was a nice bit of kit. It's got a 360 in it that's been stroked out to 426, running a 727 with a gear vendor overdrive on it. Oh, I've just loved Valiance all my life, I've always had Valiance. I had another one of these that I was doing up, but uh, just uh, got, got a bit tired. <laughs> so I went and brought one that was all finished. Love the shape of the hard tops, nice classic lines. Not many of them around. Gets in your blood and um, hard to get rid of, yeah. Lurking beneath the clock tower was a bit of a blast from the past. The body off overhaul on this matching numbers 409 Cube 63 Impala was the subject of a 10 part TV series called Real Rides. Yeah, originally built about 12 years ago for Louis Anderson from the Vodafone Warriors, uh, built by um, Auto Colour Matrix up in Auckland. Been looking for cars out of the States, you know, there's all the horror, horror stories of some of the cars that are coming out. This one obviously was built here, already registered and warranted. It had a complete chassis off rebuild. You know, everything was pretty much done and done to a very high standard. And the fact that it was a 12 year old car and there was no rust coming out on it or anything like that, I knew. The other real cool thing obviously was that it was, was done originally for a TV show back in the day and I was able to find some of the YouTube clips and actually go back and see some of the work that had been done on the car. So, you know, it was, it, and it had that history, you know. 409 Big Block, uh, pretty rare engine, obviously built only for four or uh, five years and uh, it's a matching four speed, um, they're a T10. Rare for it differs uh, running uh, 336s. It was a 373 ratio originally, but I've rebuilt the diff and just made it a little bit cruisier. Um, other than that, yeah, it's got all four-wheel disc brakes on it now. Uh, we've put a um, Hydra Boost system on there, so she brakes like a modern car, which is, you know, you need today. 
back in the day in 62 and 63 they run and run a uh, race then hra um you know she's got a bit of bit of power but there's a lot of work i'd like to do to the motor to get it a bit more but you know up to today's sort of standards but yeah no, she's she's a cool car to drive it's very very comfortable gets up and goes uh, yeah a lot of fun standing out from the 750 strong pack was steve and leanne milne's slick 56 210 chevrolet the two-door post sedan scooping best in show and best engine Aroha Cruising will be back bigger and better than ever in 2020. Your ride needs some love? We've got you sorted. Thanks to our mates at Meguiar's, we have this massive complete car care pack worth $700 to give away, plus a $500 mount shop voucher to keep the underside ship shape too. And to top it off, a one-year subscription to NZV8 magazine. To enter, simply head to themotorhood.com and hit the 10 Tools Muscle Garage link. And while you're there, make sure you get your name in the draw for NZV8's massive Summer Nats 2020 experience. The prize includes return flights for you and a mate, four nights accommodation, and of course, platinum passes to this Aussie event that's like no other. What are you waiting for? 10 Tools Muscle Garage was proudly brought to you by 10 Tools. Get organized. Mount Shop, undercar specialists. Maguires, people who love cars, love Maguires. And Need a Car, the easy way to research and buy cars online.